This, by the way, is the College of Complexes. And if you wandered in uh, looking for a, a piece of pie and a cup of coffee, under uh, uh, the mistake that this was just a restaurant, it is also the meeting place of the College of Complexes uh, and on Saturday nights. And uh, tonight we have uh, Professor Robert Lichtenberg who will be professing on the question of is materialism real? Or, oh wait, is it? It's differently phrased. And here he is, in person, our famous professor of philosophy, Robert Lichtenberg.
some sober intellectualizing about the uh, materialistic society. Uh, this, this is a little brighter. I forget, James, this is much better. Um, uh, about uh, materialistic society. College complexes is more than, and they got hyphenated. More than materialism provides just that. Each week, the group invites guest speakers to shoot the shit, quote, uh, on a number of liberal pet causes. Does that sound right to you? No. Uh, 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 that's not what I think so. It's better than mine. I better than mine. I need it. I don't like to see this or to pass it around. I might be distracted. <laughs> I might be a distraction. Uh, so forget it. Um, yeah, sorry about this room. This is a terrible setup. Uh, probably should have you at this side. The light is. Yeah. With all the um, these boots here are terrible, and it's an idea of your back for me for a whole night. The counter is not appropriate. And uh, we've been exiled after a long time because of the nose comedy group in there trying to blow the beer out of their noses. It's really oriented toward drinking and humor, which is disgusting. Um, but you know, they sell more, sell more that way, and that's the name of the game today. We're all just trying to get some silky lucre off, as I pronounce it, or money, just to, so we could survive. Um, that's the name of the game. Um, well, and I think that's kind of a result of materialistic attitude. That's a consequence. That's what happened, is that we did end up with, with stuff like that, with people just trying to survive by um, making money as their main goal in life. And I'll talk more about that. I have no idea how long this talk will take. I, my own view is it might take a long time. <laughs> I haven't tried it out on anyone. Um, so maybe I won't even read most of it off. Um, and at the end, well, that's a major part. First, I start out with um, um, <clears throat> a definition of materialism. And I define materialism as I do there in the ethical sense. It's the view or the philosophy um, that the acquisition of material possessions is the greatest thing, greatest good in a person's life. Um, and there I think it's a predominant philosophy of our society today and has been for many years. Unfortunately, it's a very bad philosophy, very poor philosophy, as I intend to show in the ethical sense. I won't really talk about the other senses. <clears throat> Um, not materialism, anyhow. Um, but so this attitude, I have many criticisms of ethical materialism. I listed a bunch of them, and I could go on and on about them forever. Um, <laughs> but I just stop. All right, we hear ethical materialism from day one. The day we're born, that's what we see. People trying to buy stuff. Yeah, and that's right. And that's the name of the game. And uh, if you buy a lot of stuff, you're a big winner, you're a big success. It's so easy, it's so obvious. Um, <clears throat> what else is there? What else can you see? Everything else is pretty hard, that's for sure. But I think it's well worth the effort. As I'll describe and as I argue at the end of my, very end of my talk. Um, yeah, but um, sure brainwashed in this from birth. And um, it has become a dogma. And I'd say most people today are materialists, most, um, in practice. That's their philosophy they practice. Trying to get as much stuff as they can. That's pretty much all they have. But um, a lot of people do um, assume what I call blind faith, blind faith in God. And uh, uh, this faith is going to save them in the end, they think, <clears throat> as long as they don't hurt anyone during their lives. Um, but um, um, I, think, I think they're all going to be uh, uh, deeply and eternally <laughs> disappointed if there is a God. He's got, um, well, certainly um, not um, <clears throat> respect, blind faith. Um, and they'll boot them straight to hell. And if the stories are true, they'll burn there forever. And if Jesus says it's in the, it's in the Bible, in the Gospels. 
Um, but uh, I do think it's fair. It's a fair deal. People know the rules. They just don't want to play by them. They just want to take the easy way out. Materialism. Um, all right, I'm not here to talk about blind faith or even God or religion. So no, never religion, but, but um, um, I'm here to talk about materialism. So a lot of people act like materialism is the most important thing in their lives. And my students certainly assume that. And I say that that's the most important thing for them is to get a job and make a lot of money and buy a lot of stuff. And that's what they want to do. Of course, they want to get married and have a family. So like I say later, um, they're all... <laughs> In effect, I, I tell them, excuse me, I tell them this, that uh, you got to try and do more in your life, do more with your life than be a money-making machine who's trying to reproduce that. And there's really not much point to that, you know. I mean, why even bother? A lot of people running around without much point to it. Yes, I'm going to make a lot of extreme statements. Uh, might get me in trouble, but at least I'll get you going. Uh, a lot of people seem just to be running around trying to buy stuff, and that's all they do. Um, um, they have little else, that's sort of blind faith, which is really going to disappoint them. Um, end up in hell forever. Might as well get a Red Union suit and a pitchfork right now. You know? I mean, they're going to live that way their whole life. And at the end, it's too late. It's too late when you die. I disagree with some churches. If you say you're sorry at the end, that's cool. That's enough. I don't agree with that either. But I'm not going to go into that. Piece. So most people end up slaves to materialism. Uh, slaves, yeah, because it takes away their freedom. Because a lot of them end up working at jobs just for money, just to uh, just to um, make make money to survive. And they'll be happy if they get that. That's the number one goal. They don't get around to number two very often. They don't have a plan B usually. So the plan A exhausts them. Materialism exhausts people. And they get all worn out in their stressful jobs and they don't have time for anything else. How far are they? Um, you know, for them to screw around on computers these days, that takes a lot of time. Um, there's still a lot of killing time going on, too. Remember that expression? Well, too. Hi. Is, uh, welcome. Um, takes no imagination whatsoever to appreciate materialism. It's there. It's obvious. And it gives you a lot of control over your life. You can go out and buy pretty much what most people want out of life. And they just want a bunch of stuff. Um, a bunch of things. Um, these things really, though, they become garbage eventually. And it all wears out, becomes junk. But then you go out and buy new stuff, and you get a little boost in that. So you can keep going that way, and a lot of people do. Um, <clears throat> so materialism is um, a basic need of life, no doubt about it. You need it. You absolutely have to have it to survive. Don't ask why. How <laughs> uh, I many do? Uh, they don't like the answer, so they. Well, never mind. I'm uh, generalizing there. <laughs> uh, about Abraham Maslow, the psychologist who first studied human needs, he, he said that the physical is the first need and the basic need, and you must satisfy the physical need before you go on to any other needs to be satisfied. Higher needs, like social needs and belonging needs, and lo uh, love <clears throat> and knowledge. Um, uh, the other idea is the life you must have. Um, the physical needs to survive, so you must be a materialist, as Maslow. Well, a lot of you are familiar with the psychologist. So, materialism is a basic need, and the desire to possess things uh, is very strong in humans, very strong. I mean, we, we want to have stuff. Hardly anyone go along with the idea that the state owns stuff. I mean, that's just not going to work. You know, as Marx and communists uh, found out, oh, you didn't really experiment with it too much before it actually came totally corrupt system. But we do want to possess things ourselves, um, maybe to show off how great we are, or how good we are, how big of a success we are. And um, terrorism matters just what it is. That's it. It is what it is. 
you know, you get a big house, you get a big house. Okay. And if you add to your house, you get a bigger house. Buy a bigger house, you get a bigger house. Might want a big boat. Yeah. Um, we've got other examples there. Um, but at least it is what it is. And that's all it means. It could mean a lot if it is a lot. Um, like a lot of money or a lot of stuff. Uh, that's the only way. But at least it's real. It's there. It's obvious. And that's enough for most people. It's enough. And that's very sad. That they're, that, and they think that's enough for them. Uh, present companies are all excluded, of course. We're all exempted because we're here talking about ideas. So we want more out of life. And we keep such uh, great uh, institutions alive as the college complexes. Um, so we're exempt. From my general view, which I'll mention a little later, that the hippies with their great ideas and peace, love, and understanding quickly sold out. When the economy just got a little tough, and the Vietnam War ended, and all, almost all the yuppies, um, sorry, all the hippies, uh, sold out and became yuppies. I don't mean an age by that. I just mean a group of uh, people who want to uh, own a lot of stuff. Those are yuppies. And the hippies all became yuppies. And um, they became something that's quite possible. They became greedy. <laughs> And they, they couldn't regulate their greed. And as a result of their greed, they did no less than wreck the economy of this country and made it severely worse um, by their unregulated greed. And I'll explain that a little bit. But um, <coughs> um, thank you. <coughs> I was going to say something else tonight. Yeah. Um, I'll get back to you. But it was really my generation that failed and ruined uh, the country with their greed and materialism for our young people. Yep. That's, the, that's my uh, struggling to get jobs, working their asses off and getting nowhere. Um, uh, you know, I, we did ruin the economy at that man. It's going to be ruined for a long time. It's going to be in the toilet for a long time. So we're ruining it for ourselves. Well, we deserve it. Present company, because we mean true to the hippie ideals, not the hippie ones. <laughs> well, like I said, I'll get back to that. Okay, back to uh, summarizing materialism. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of people highly respect materialism. Yeah. My students really respect it. Yeah. And they'd like to have a piece of it too for themselves <clears throat> and their families. That's yeah, about the only thing they highly respect. <laughs> Now he's been learning, not the typical student, the good student, but those are getting harder and harder. Well, uh, well okay. uh, uh, and then they don't respect <coughs> professors. Uh, now I respect hardly any thing except materialism. Yeah, I'd have to think hard to find something else that they respect. But materialism, no problem. No problem, they don't want it. No, I want a piece of the pie. So, to conclude about materialism, it's really strong, it's really powerful. It has a lot of appeal. It demands little. So, slaving your wallet life away at a meaningless job, if that's little. Um, oh, not all jobs are meaningless, of course. I mean, why am I, why am I to a big extent? Because it can't be done to make money. Make money for the company, number one. And then for you, number two. Um, uh, uh, I keep forgetting where I am here, because I got two, two, two notes here, but okay, materialism is a strong enemy because it offers so much and it offers so little. Um, and it's so real and so obvious that to have, find other alternatives is really hard, it's terribly hard. Um, to find an alternative to something so easy and obvious as mm, buying stuff, you know. And, and that's, that could be a little fun, <laughs> uh, as long as you can keep doing it, you know, and you get a little boost out of that. And most people are content with that, just like the Borden's cows are content, you know, and Dave Miller, you know, the comparison, I think. Rob does too, but he's the only one who gets it. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so let me start now with the criticisms of materialism, and those are very major and very nice. Uh, of ethical materialism, not, 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 uh, not a physical materialism. Um, I'm not really going to talk about that tonight. But the big problem with uh, ethical materialism is it's a very, very narrow philosophy, and it's very, very shallow philosophy, because it, it, it leaves everything out except material stuff. Of course, the materialist think that's the only reality anyhow. That oh, the other reality is much too hard, but we really do need it. But um, so, so it's very shallow and they just take things at their surface appearance and they don't plunge deeply into life. And they profess ignorance about anything non-material, it's too hard. And they don't know. They all say, I don't know about I don't know. I don't know about God. Um, <clears throat> You know, uh, whether that yeah, it is or not, if there's anything good or just, those ideas are really over my head and difficult. And they are hard, they are very hard. Um, but nevertheless, materialism still is quite inadequate as a guide to our lives. Uh, it drives us only to pursue more garbage eventually. It's not satisfying, really. Um, since it's such a base desire, um, um, most people aren't pleased with it at all for long. They want more stuff. And they want more stuff or bigger stuff, and that will make them happier and give them more contentment. So they go after that. And so the end result is they end up with unmitigated greed. And they become totally greedy. And this greed is often themselves or their nuclear family. Okay. Their materialist uh, goals in life is all they care about. Um, and if they succeed, they have a smug attitude of happiness. Um, a righteous view that they won the game of life. Uh, but the greed just really gets out of control. And that's what all people develop. In this, well, so many people, not all, so many people, not us, <laughs> so many people develop themselves and dedicate their entire life to just get more stuff all their lives. Um, um, so, since materialism is so greedy, it's, it is empty and unfulfilling. <coughs> as well as essentially selfish. Um, seeing the current lifestyle of our society for many years now at least, and it would be hard to count. And Parker Dean here at the college um, is how it's very wasteful and very destructive of the environment. That's not the theme, so I hope no one will talk about that. Um, uh, but it does ruin the planet because we just want more gas and you know, we don't care if we pollute. Um, if we don't feel the effects, hardly anyone will care. Or most people won't care. Uh, as long as they get their stuff now. Yeah, that's what it's all about. But it is destructive and it is very wasteful of the energy. And the resources of the plant, we're exhausting them. They're not unlimited. No, they'll soon be gone at our current rate. Unless we do something soon, drastically, and that's very unlikely. Unless everything goes kaput right away. Um, uh, so it is wasteful. We're living at a uh, materialism is a sub, sub, sub animal level of existence. Oh, animal. Animals don't get greedy. Animals just satisfy their need for food and shelter, and they don't accumulate stuff. I'm sure you can find a few species that do, though. Or a few greedy species. But not the my humans. Not the my humans. Uh, and what we do to the earth. So it's below the animals. Beneath the animals is below the dignity of an animal. It certainly is below the dignity of a human. Although, and that's... that's um, one of my biggest complaints about um, materialism, ethical materialism, it's just not sufficient 
for us to live the most meaningful lives that we can. It's not sufficient. It's needed, definitely needed. But hopefully, no one will ever consider it enough for a reflective, self-respecting human being. A human being will want more out of life than just a bunch of stuff. Um, but it's real hard to put your finger on that. But hopefully there are broader purposes to our lives and why we are here. But perhaps my biggest criticism of materialism is that uh, it is, um, uh, the materialists just don't care about, about any of this. You know, nobody cares about getting more stuff. And it's really hard to get through to them anything more and get them to care about anything more unless there's some stuff in it for them somehow. They usually don't give a you know what. Okay, that's my critique of uh, material, and I think it's pretty severe and harsh. Um, but maybe we can talk about it in discussion and see if I exaggerated. Um, but um, let me move on to an uh, important section of my talk, which is arguments for intangibles. I consider this very um, dear to my heart, and I love this kind of stuff very much. Um, now I'm really leaving ethics and going into metaphysics, going into reality, the nature of reality. What really does exist? Does anything non-material exist? And can we make any sense out of it? And can we do anything with it? Can we relate to it in any way in our daily lives? Metaphysics, <clears throat> metaphysical um, uh, reality, is it spiritual? Is it non-physical in any way? Very difficult question to know today. Very hard in view of our um, poor ways of knowing. Uh, we're not taught any ways of knowing. We're taught to memorize a bunch of facts if you went to school like I did. And um, we weren't given any methods or think techniques or theories of knowledge whatsoever. Uh, but the thing that came closest to that was um, you might have learned a little bit about scientific method in college, and it was in your textbooks in high school, but it probably went over your head. <laughs> I'm sure it was in a lot of textbooks. But um, it's a bit much for a high school student. They don't really start getting abstractions until they get, um, well, in upper years of college, but then they're socializing too <laughs> a lot, too busy for that stuff. Um, Sports are real big exercise, <laughs> you know, with, with high school students, as if they need it. Um, I think we do. But, um, yeah, is there any uh, non-physical reality? Well, if you go into what I uh, described in uh, my blurb for this week, there's such a thing I call personal philosophy. And personal philosophy is all about our personal lives, our daily lives. Try and guide those and regulate those as best we can to do the best and the most that we can with their lives. And it does try to answer the traditional big questions of philosophy, like God and goodness and justice and truth and beauty and freedom, free will, and the self, and all these good things. Um, <clears throat> big things, important things, but difficult things of life. Uh, personal philosophy to try to uh, uh, discuss those and talk about those and come up with something. Um, realizing we never get the right answer, we could always get a better answer. The main thing is to be very open to the possibility that you might be wrong about your answers and you need to go on and uh, <clears throat> get a broader view and get more information and knowledge. And keep going. You never get a good answer, but you always get better ones. More informed bigger, broader. Um, so we all need to live in accord with that, with our own best ideas, and they should be our own ideas. They should be original to us. They shouldn't be from our society. The society doesn't care. Society only cares about materialism. Society only cares about surviving and obeying the laws and not making trouble. And that's pretty much it for, for the mass, for mass society today. Um, they don't care about the finer things of life much, uh, only a few individuals, certainly not society as a whole. So that's, um, that's personal philosophy. Uh, it's very different from academic philosophy. 
I've taught in the colleges and professed by the real professors. I wasn't a real professor, as Brown said. I was, um, I was his uh, adjunct professor for most of my career, uh, 35 years. I was full professor for six years. Five of them were at Citadel, which is a military college in Charleston, South Carolina, to test the military, to test war and fighting, you know, but I wore a uniform. And I was a captain, um, not to make money, but to get a job as a professor. As a captain in South Carolina, an organized militia, abbreviated scum. Um, and I would salute the cadets as they walked in their gutters, and hey, how you doing? But, um, <clears throat> Yeah, I'm not a real professor. I, I didn't. I was able to avoid academic philosophy a lot, and I, and I was able to go my own path into personal philosophy. Uh, academic philosophy of little interest to anyone, except, um, unless you like ideas for their own sake, and unless you're a professor who's seeking to publish papers and get tenure and um, promotions and pay raises by publishing these papers, have no use to anyone except other professors. And they're not really going to use them either. They're just gonna, write other papers on so they can get promotions and pay raises too. And that's all the good those are, for the most part. Once in a while there's an exception, but it's a great while. Um, all right, so uh, we come now upon something I call intangibles. Um, and those to me are non-materialistic realities, non-physical, spiritual. Spiritual entities, <laughs> These are basic big ideas, big truths. So, truths or ideas. Um, and I think these really do exist. And I'm going to present a bunch of arguments for them in just a couple of minutes. I have to explain what intangibles are. Um, intangibles do truly exist on their own level, it's a non material level on a physical level, spiritual level, or domain, or realm, they're very different from the physical. As we'll see when we talk about the mind, the human mind or brain, um, <clears throat> about these non-physical realities that do interact and mix with the physical realities, but not a whole lot, not a whole lot. You won't find a lot of the ideas of goodness, truth, justice, beauty, in this earth, on this earth. You'll find them once in a blue moon. <laughs> You'll find a little bit of them, little pieces of them. Uh, but as the uh, great philosopher Plato, and poet Plato, uh, he's a better philosopher than poet, that's for sure, he's a bad poet. But uh, he's a great philosopher, and he's, he said, um, this earth, this dark cave we're living in, these homes, this crappy side of the restaurant, the other side's better, there's more tables. Fewer boots, why aren't we over there? First time. <laughs> Is that because we'd be in front of the cash register and interfering with that? Mm. Materialism again, huh? Don't interfere with the sacred altar. But I digress. Um, yeah, but we are living in a dark cave. Um, and we need to get out of it. We need to escape. By wanting to escape, no one's going to make you escape or help you escape. Uh, you got to want to get out of yourself to live your own life, put in your own ideas, and you got to break your chain to society, the conventions of society and materialism. You know, that's its main convention today. Um, uh, so you got to go out in the bright sunlight, said Plato, and look at the um, ideas themselves to break forms. Is how it's usually translated. He he used the word ideas, and that's a lot better word. But ideas has changed its meaning since Plato's time. What he meant by idea was a, a thought or a truth. And these truths really do exist non-physically on the second level of the two-story house. Intangibles cannot be touched. That's what the word intangible means. You can't touch them physically, they're not physical, so you can't touch them. And um, you can't see them either. Uh, that's not the word intangible. I certainly can't see them. You cannot directly experience any of them, except maybe through the mind, if you want to count that. Or I wouldn't. This experience is mostly of the senses, and you can't sense them directly. Uh, you can find evidence of them indirectly. 
Oh, it's, that's usually not easy to abstract them. But these ideas are out there, and we need to discover them, discover the truths that are really out there. According to me, according to Plato, it's a very platonic view that I hold. I wanted a few Platonists today among um, people who study philosophy. I'm a such professor, but not a professor, uh, technically. <laughs> Uh, so I need to discover these truths by our own uh, deep thinking about them. We don't make them up. You make them up, they're not going to work. Um, you have to find them, not invent them. That's what we do, I think. All right, so now I'm going to go on to the arguments for the existence of intangibles, the long, important part of my talk. Uh, I'm going to be real brief on these, though, in view of how um, complex they are. And I'm going to oversimplify the arguments, uh, just to avoid the controversies. They don't really have a clear resolution, clear answer. Um, uh, and this is the hardest part of my talk, definitely. Don't feel bad if you don't get it. Most of my students don't either. <laughs> All right, number one, the first argument. That's Charlie. Oh, there he is. Pointing out some think Thomas Aquinas. I'm the only one on the thing. <laughs> um, Aquinas argued, and his arguments for them. Well, but I'm adopting it from there. They must have looked at the idea of cause from cause and effect. And he both pointed out causes prior to its effect. So, in order to have anything, you have to have a cause. And that's a big, important part of science. Without that, we have no science. We have no real science that's going to do anything in the world. Not like ours. It's just such great stuff. <laughs> uh, did a lot of bad things, too. Well, it did, 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 did do a lot of great things. Maybe overdid them. But anyhow, cause and effect. Uh, not only is the cause prior to the effect, but the cause is higher than the effect. The cause is, has more power than the effect. You know, this wood here has the uh, potential to burn, uh, but it won't burn unless there's a cause to make it burn. So you need a match which has actual fire and actual heat to apply to the wood, and then the wood can burn and be on fire and be hot too. Uh, but see, the cause has a, is not only prior to the effect, but for the effect. Oh, this gets real weird in quantum physics. I don't want to go there right now. Uh, I'll go there a little bit later, but uh, um, the cause is not only prior to the effect, it's greater than the effect, it has powers uh, that the effect does not have. Therefore, that means there are higher powers in existence, causes. Uh, causes are greater powers, they have actual powers, whereas the effect, matter, only has potential powers. And you've got to have a greater actual power. And if you carry out the very important idea of cause and effect in science, the scientific idea, if you carry that out to its logical conclusions, and I know people don't like to do that. They, they stop when it's convenient to them. Uh, uh, you know, or, they, or when they don't like where the argument's going. But if you carry it out to its logical conclusions, there must be a supernatural cause are supernatural powers of all matter and all nature. That's causes are greater powers than their effects. I don't like the word cause very much there, but powers is a great word. There are higher powers, and these are intangibles, intangible relations, uh, intangible reality things. Um, um, greater, supernatural. Um, greater than all nature. That's, you know, if you just carry out the idea of cause and effect, to its logical conclusion. Um, okay, that's the first time I think it's strong. I think it's very strong. Now, there's no physical evidence directly there. Um, but they demand physical evidence, which, which a lot of people do today, is, is a very narrow theory of knowledge. It will only apply to physical things. That's, that's the only thing you prove and know. It's science, by definition. 
from the start. You start with matter only, you're going to end up with matter only. You know what you're going to get anything more. <coughs> um, so I think there's a lot of good rational evidence for um, higher powers, uh, like the intangibles. That would include God, but it would include other things. The truths about goodness, justice, beauty, our higher powers. And God is even more troublesome with that. Maybe it's like at the end. All right, second argument for intangibles, there has to be absolutes, and there has to be standards. Uh, these are conditions for our world making any sense. And if you didn't have absolute standards, absolute source standards, <coughs> everything would be chaos. Generalities won't work, won't get any scientific control that way. Uh, you might get a little control, but things would be pretty much a mess. Even thinking would be, unless there's some absolutes in thinking, and there is absolutes in thinking. Um, one example is the laws of logic. They tell us the rules for thinking. Like you should think in arguments, use premises to support a conclusion and a syllogism it's come. You should not contradict yourself for that. That's another example of a rule of logic. And these rules of logic are true of all societies, all times, without exception. I mean, if you go against them, you need to get something illogical. But in order to think uh, correctly, you need to follow the rules of logic. And there's many of them. Some are pretty picky. Uh, there's rules on how to not think. Not think. <laughs> um, a part of logic too. But the point is, these, there are universal absolutes and standards for thinking in the rules of logic. They're universal for all societies at all times. They're a condition of thinking. They're a condition of making sense of the world. Of the world making sense. That does make sense, you know. We like it to make more sense, you know. There is a rationality and illogic in it. Lots of it death, for example, is everywhere in every species, but all, all, all members of all species, but and then the other things aren't even alive, so how could it say? But, uh, you know, you know to, to make sense of the world, we do need logic. And I do think there's absolutes and there are standards in ethics, too. These aren't just words or ideas, these are realities, our actions, our behaviors, they have rules of ethics that guide them, or should guide them, ought to guide them. And I'll give you examples of those toward the end. All right, argument number three for intangibles is from human consciousness. Human consciousness um, is not materialistic, it's not a matter of matter. It can't all be from the brain, although most of it no doubt is. But there has to be more um, to our knowledge and awareness than the brain. Uh, consciousness does mean awareness, and awareness we know is found in our brains. We're aware of many things. We're aware of an outside world. Like this uh, dumpy counter area right now that we've been exiled to. We're aware of that. Not too happy about it. Uh, you know, it's a materialistic age, what can you do? Submit. Well, you can rebel. Thank you. Uh, I'll explain how at the end. But, uh, what was I saying? Uh, we're aware of many things. We're even aware of ourselves. And maybe animals are too. They're aware of the world. But our consciousness is uh, not a thing. It's not matter. It's not easy to grasp, but consciousness, awareness, is really a quality, a state of mind. It's you being aware that there is something outside of you or inside of you, but it's not a thing. It's aware of things, everything um, around you and inside of you that you could perceive, but yet yeah, your perception is not, I mean, your, your, your perception is not the same 
as the kings. It's a, it's a state of mind, it's a quality. A higher quality. Uh, it's a mental quality, it's intangible, it's spiritual, it's not physical, it can't be quantified. Like say, obviously, love. Can you measure the, your love with someone? Certainly love is more than a word. Um, <clears throat> that's another intangible. Does anyone like uh, my drawings of a list of intangibles? I got a few of those left. Okay, consciousness then is not a thing, it's not the brain, it's not the gooey brain. You cannot find thinking in the brain, it cannot be localized, how could it be? Thinking is, is ideas, you're using ideas and feelings. You can find the feelings in the brain, how are you going to find consciousness of feelings? They haven't figured that out. But they surely haven't figured out where you find the ideas in the brain. There's no place in the brain that contains ideas or produces ideas. However, there is there is cerebral cortex, the highest part of the brain, where uh, it's more active when you're thinking abstractly. It's more active. But is that the same as thinking? Is that the same as ideas? It's not. It's just 30 watts of electricity sparking. Will that get, will that get the consciousness going? Am I going to try? Can I say something? No? Okay. See you later. Appreciate it. That's more detailed. Yes, honey. Fresh cup coming right now. <laughs> um, okay, there's more to say about that, but um, um, deep ideas like goodness, justice, beauty, and all the other intangibles are nowhere to be found. They're made in the brain. Okay, number four. We have a rationalistic way of knowing. It's called rationalism in philosophy. Um, we can know big truths simply by grasping them, purely by thinking. Um, um, we do have the ability to understand ideas, big ideas. For example, math, advanced math. Can you sense that? Can you experience, can your brain manipulate symbols to get it? Can you touch the number three, even? Uh, you can touch a symbol for three, but can you touch three itself? Can you make three in the brain? Hmm. Only if there's an idea for you to know, if you ask me. Descartes tried to doubt everything, and I did doubt everything. <laughs> everything he sensed. Long ago, one night, um, but then the next night he resumed his doubting and he found out there was something I cannot doubt. Um, doubt everything. You could do this now yourself. Close your eyes and doubt everything. Doubt you exist and doubt that there's other people. Um, you know, and all that. There's still something that remains. Anyone know what it is? And if you doubt everything, there's still something. I think therefore I am. I think therefore I am. I think they make the right answer. Um, yeah, he couldn't doubt that he was thinking. Even if he doubted it, that's a form of thinking. He can't doubt thinking itself. Um, we, 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 we have an innate idea, said Descartes. We're born with these ideas. And uh, we um, apply them in experience. Experience is only the occasion of our ideas. Um, coming out and uh, knowing the physical world. But you got to have the ideas. If you don't have the ideas, you can't get the concept or the perception. You don't have the knowledge. You don't get knowledge without the proper ideas or sensations. You've got to get it. Your mind has to grasp it. And this could extend to um, deep truths mostly. 
And you know, the funny thing about this, you know, the empiricist philosopher said, you know, well, no, we learn anything by experience, it's simple. I, I see a see thing, I form an abstraction of it, but um, it's funny, but um, geneticists today are verifying in a very scientific way that um, we are wired to know things. And the first person who showed this, don't use proof, proof is too strong of a word. Proof only refers to physical things, as that's how much we lowered our knowledge. We cheapen that word just to mean something scientific only. Uh, so proof doesn't apply to intangibles. It only applies to science. And that's what the word means today in our lowered state of wisdom. They have more facts, so. though. Yeah, lots more things than we ever did. Um, yeah, the first guy to, it was a guy, <laughs> who proved this was a friend of some of yours. Some of you have heard of him. Noam Chomsky, the lefty, radical, progressive thinker at MIT, almost um, was unemployed too, <laughs> but they brought back his department so he could have a job. Because he has a big name. But of course, you know, he's, he's in the politics now. But early in his career, he was a linguist. And he just observed something amazing and special. He observed that children began to speak language on their own. And they weren't imitating their parents. They spoke in sentences. And they weren't copying their parents' sentences. They were imitating what their parents said. by using up their words. Not only were they using their words, they were, not only were they using their own words that they hadn't heard before, but they were using in grammatical sentences. So they knew the rules of syntax and grammar, which are not easy. They're very complex, especially in English. There's many exceptions, yet they can do it. And, um, <clears throat> um, you know, this goes, goes, goes beyond experience. So Chomsky revised rationalism before it went into politics. Um, uh, but he did um, demonstrate, so almost prove, <laughs> that uh, I'm competing with those dishes. Huh? He almost proved that um, we have an innate idea. We are wired, as they put it these days. We are wired. Everyone is wired. Unless something abnormal happens. Everyone is wired to um, learn one language, to learn a language, a language of your society. If you are raised with wolves, you'll speak wolf language. Some children have done that. But their, their language isn't that simple either. It's a lot simpler than ours, but it's some complexity. <laughs> and wolf we'll talk. And, uh, um, like I say, geneticists today are proving more and more how we're wired to have knowledge. And that, uh, certain types of knowledge, advanced knowledge, we do have what's called intuitions or insights. Or we can get them into the truth. Now, Stahl said this a long time ago. He called it this faculty of intuitive grasp of the truth. He called it NOUS, N-O-U-S. Um, so we do have epistemological reasons for believing that intangible still exists. OK. Uh, Argument number five, constraints. We have many constraints on us and how we relate to others. It's not right just to poke someone like my son here in the eye for no reason. We're constrained from doing that. We're constrained in a lot of ways in how we deal with people. And there's these rules and forces unwritten that have strong power of us. And they're a part of human dignity. Uh, okay, I want to move quickly. Uh, Chapter nine already. Oh, I didn't start with eight, of course. But um, the sixth argument for intangibles is uh, in the physical world itself. We find intangibles, like math. Math, for example, I believe is intangible. Numbers do exist in the realm of ideas, and we you know, try to know them. Um, uh, they exist on the level of pure ideas, like all intangibles. For example, pi and the imaginary number, imaginary number, square root of minus one. Um, 
can't exist in physical space, I could do an existent intangible realm as the form of all things on Earth. Oh, but these ideas do exist. These purely abstract formal ideas, that's all, yeah. Um, and also, okay, in current physics, as weird as it is today and counterintuitive, and nobody really fully understands it, nobody, so I don't pretend to, but there are laws, there still are laws that hold for the universe, and these laws are intangible. And that physical, I can't give an example of one because they're way too complicated. There are probability functions and wave functions, and I don't understand them, I can't state them, but there are still laws that hold even in quantum physics, which makes the universe very, very weird indeed. Um, so there are these laws um, that do exist out there. Uh, in the physical world. As a matter of fact, these laws might be prior to God himself. This is Plato noticed a long time ago. Even God has to obey the laws himself. And maybe the laws are prior to even God. That's a possibility. Yeah, it's a good one. You know, God has to allow evils, natural evils, like a knife has to cut your food, but it can cut you. And God can't make any exceptions to that for anyone. Or they can't expect them to, so maybe the laws from open space it, just a side light. Um, there are intangible things that exist, like photons have no mass, they're just waves of light. But they're real. They have light. Uh, so at least in one of its aspects, the wave aspects, we have an intangible. But, and also neutrinos, also and intangible and they could pass through matter and just weakly interacting. And they seem massless too. They, have, they exist. They're real. So the universe contains intangibles in current physics and in mathematics. That's one of my arguments for intangibles. I'm going to take a sip of coffee, I guess. Yeah, nothing. I'll get too excited. None of these are valid. Material stimulation. Right. Um, okay, now I did a very difficult job in the last section of my paper of applying this doctrine of intangibles to our daily lives. Applying them there. Let's see if they come up with a better philosophy than materialism. That shouldn't be too hard. <laughs> uh, materialism is a terrible philosophy. The main criticisms. It's now. Can you hear me okay? I need to close that damn door again. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. You don't want to hear them blow their beer out of their nose, do you? That's what they're trying to do in there. Matter of fact, they advertise that farm. They advertise that when they started that first uh, Friday night. Um, you know, Friday Night Comedy Club, you'll blow the beer out of your nose, you'll laugh so hard. You know? and, and that comedy club is revolving around alcohol and booze, they're telling you. Yeah, look at the name as you go out. And, what they, I don't know what they call it. Blackout Tower, the yeah, Blackout. That's supposed to be funny, I tell you, other people are right there. They're beating the pants off of us. We're out here after 15 years, and they're there because they're making more money. And that's what it's come to, where materialism so but, but, but materialism has that great appeal of money, moolah, you know, things, stuff. How can you deny it? You get stuff easy, just sacrifice yourself at some dumb job and make a lot of money. Well, there's, there's good jobs to them. I mean, to deny it. Uh, but, but to have a philosophy better and more attractive and more real than that, um, not easy. I think I could do it. <laughs> I think I could do it. Um, um, by applying the intangibles to big areas of our lives. Um, <clears throat> and the hard part, though, is to know the truth of intangibles, truth and intangibles. That's very hard. I don't think we do a very good job of that with our finite, very finite, puny intellects. Are very weak. I'm not very good at them. Yeah. Except a few people, maybe. Most of us get lost after five simple ideas at one time. We're confused. 
Yeah, I know I am. Um, so it's hard to know these intangibles. I think we can know some of them enough to guide us a lot better than materialism does, and a lot better than materialism. Um, uh, okay, um, the first area I want to apply in these doctrine of intangibles is to um, ethics, because that was what I talked about, uh, materialistic ethics. So can intangibles supply a better uh, ethical life for us? Hmm. Well, I got most of this on page two of my um, overview. Um, sure, we could provide land higher and purer standards than unregulated greed and materialism results in, because a lot of people have a very, I think I neglected to say this when I was talking about um, uh, criticisms of materialism, and I, I neglected to say that a lot of people cannot control their desires. <laughs> desires are very hard to control. They're difficult, like sex and eating and making money, are very difficult to get under our own self-control. Very hard for most of us and most, for most desires. I've heard it said a desire cannot ever be satisfied. You cannot satisfy a desire. I don't agree with that. I kind of wish it was true. <laughs> My job be easier, but it's it's just very hard to satisfy any desire. Anything you could really satisfy is needs. Um, you can satisfy a need. You can satisfy a material need. You can satisfy a need for love and belonging. Um, but a desire is very hard to satisfy. So they get out of control and they end up in greed for most people. Most people's lives would just be basically greedy and selfish. They'll just be trying to buy stuff for themselves all life. So can I come up with anything better than that? Yeah. Higher and purer standards. One, one intangible truth uh, in the realm of the good and the intangible of the good uh, is that humans exist in an ethical dimension. Okay. Ethical dimension is, um, we, how do I put that? We live in a realm where, um, I can't find it right now, uh, where doing good really matters to humans, or it should matter to humans. We need to be very aware of the questions of good, and doing good, and what's right, um, and so, just to be more aware of the ethical dimensions of our life is very, very important. That we should do good as much as we can, actively, proactively. Um, that would be a great alternative to the materialistic, um, I don't know what you call it, but uh, materialistic ethics, I think most people are ethical in it simply out of fear of getting caught, doing something bad and being embarrassed and being punished, and that's the only thing that stops most people, it's the only thing that stops most of my students, they say, although they do have uh, a fair amount of guilt that's been inculcated them by their parents, <coughs> teachers, and churches, uh, so some of them are still under that. Well, a lot of them would lie, cheat, and steal if they can get away with it, and they'll admit it. The only thing that stops them is, is that they're getting caught and punished. Um, <clears throat> otherwise, they'd say they'd do it. They'd come out ahead and get some for a good price. So we need more than that. Well, okay, I got some examples of intangible truths. So the golden rule. Thank you, Mom. It's just for the cheesecake, sweetheart. What's going on? Yeah, I'm not going on. <laughs> You're out telling the Thank you so much. I'm sure a lot of your parents drive you to church. Don't get caught. Don't get caught. There you go. Two dollars the way you want to be treated. Or who has to go make the rule? That's the uh, materialist view of the golden rule. But no, this is you know, the way you want to be treated. And you want to be treated well. Uh, this counts categorical imperative. Um, there's another example. 
uh, of an ethical truth that's intangible. Uh, there's others there. I'm a hard time saying. So I use my flashlight again. So these uh, truths are hard to know, but they can be done. I did uh, give a talk on this in the uh, last um, February, if any of you would like to see that, that, that tests um, our way of knowing intangibles. There's two main tests. One is logic and the other is correspondence with uh, reality. But that would take me way too long to go into that tonight. Um, Okay, then we can make a good ethics from uh, ethical truths, from the intangibles. Um, like a person ought to care to do good caring actions for herself and others for their own sake. And this comes from Kant. I think he grasped an ethical truth, intangible there. Kant also stated in his uh, book, The Practical Imperative, he stated, very, very difficult to read and understand, um, that um, a person ought to act only on a strong sense of duty or obligation to themselves and to others. Now, uh, what if someone doesn't follow your duties? We're going to talk about that at the Urgent Supper, February 13th, I believe. What are our duties? Well, exactly which ones? If you have to address something, if you're interested in that. <laughs> but uh, even if you are hurt by others, at least you did the, um, the most good that you could do yourself by, by trying to do your duties to others by caring about them, by caring about doing good for them. Um, now, not everyone's going to follow that. Most people are going to go for the money and the materialism they say they have to to survive. I'm sure you won't prosper. Um, but you did all you could. You tried as hard as you could. No one could ask for more. As my good friend Lee Hubble once put it, rightly, I you remember Lee, um, if they're older like me. Um, but, um, uh, um, everyone needs to know intangibles. It's hard enough for you to know them. <laughs> hard enough for me to know them. But try and get others to know them. <laughs> it's really hard. We can't make them. They have to want it themselves. We can do very little to motivate them in that regard. We reason with them, but that's usually a waste of breath. <laughs> um, as I found out from a lot of experiences, uh, so, people, um, you know, um, won't act on intangible truths and we can't force them to. Uh, we can only do it ourselves. But I think that's a clear alternative to materialistic ethics. I think that's it for that. Yeah. Um, then I apply to other areas of life like art, aesthetics. You can read what I say there. I'm running out of time. I said I'd talk about free will. I mentioned a very little about free will. Um, I think that's an intangible truth that can free us. It's all you got to do is think on your own to be free, but you got to do that. So most of the time we're not free. Because <laughs> we're following what society causes us to do and forces us to do and physically makes us do, like we're dumb jobs. <laughs> You know, do a lot of conforming. We just got to do it. Um, <clears throat> um, so a lot of times we're not free, and not many people are free. As long as you think on your own, come up with your own ideas that you weren't caused to think by your society, I think you could lead a relatively free lifestyle uh, some of the time. There's a lot of things we're just caused to do, and nobody can get out of it. I adopted this argument from Aristotle, even though he didn't even raise the free will question. And finally, we come to the um, controversial point, especially here at the college. Our God, mm -hmm. this is the biggest question of them all. Does God really exist or not? 
most meanings at stake in this, because God's existence determines whether or not we're truly immortal, or are we just food for the worms when we die? So that's a big important question, and you might think it might be obvious on a view of intangibles, but I don't think it is. I think the question is so hard and so difficult that we need to study it every day for a good portion of our day. About a half hour. Uh, trying to know whether God does exist or not. Trying to see if, we, if there's any relationship we could have with God. Trying to read about God and talk to someone about God. That's really hard to find someone who's now running off from that. Um, but since it is such a meaningful question, I do think we have to study it every day for the rest of our lives to know whether or not there is a God, what his nature is. And if we try and know, try and know intangibles about God, those are the hardest of all. And the biggest of all, but the most important of all, and you can't neglect them or you're being deep due to a God, you know. If there is a God, you know, <laughs> uh, he's not going to take kindly to that, I don't think, unless you're dumb, you know, unless you did not exert your free will. And if you didn't, why didn't you? You're too busy buying stuff? Well, that doesn't count with God, man. He's not going to be merciful on that. <clears throat> He's going to say, go to hell, you know, forever. Mm -hmm. It's fair. Like, it's a fair deal. You knew the rules. Um, you didn't look? You didn't even look, most people. Or think about it. <clears throat> um, Uh, but um, that's just the truth we have to try and know as best we can. And uh, I wrote a lot more on this on another essay I wrote for my journal, The Meaning of Life, which I'm just about to finish with issue number 59 of that. I started in 1988, had one big success with it. In the Tribune, it was in the Tribune in 1991. <laughs> Uh, which is a while ago, but anyhow, it's still going. I'd be glad to give you a copy of it. If you like, I forgot to bring them with me as I left. I realized, uh oh, I left them in the house. I'm not going back. It's too big of a hassle. But I, you know, if you like, I'd be glad to give you one. Um, the one with the arguments from intangibles is there in 2007. Um, be, I'm glad to give you a copy of the article, meaning the sign of atheism. Got to bring those two tonight, Barbara and Margaret, if you like. Um, all right, but um, intangibles and more than materialism suggest we're not here just to survive, to buy stuff, to be consumerist. Consumerism, as I said at the very start, which I forgot to mention that one too, but consumerism holds that um, the greatest good is for us to be consumers and buy stuff, and that's, that's become. First of us put consumers' rights, but then became that yeah, for consumers is a way of life. <laughs> it's the best way of life, and it's the only way of life. And many people follow its path today. Look at the suburbs. <laughs> I mentioned a little about Pleasant Hill. <laughs> I don't want to offend my friends in the suburbs. It's not true. I'm not from the suburbs. So. Anyone else? You are? Oh, yeah. Tim. Yeah, for you. An too. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're not here just to buy stuff. We're not here just to live. We're not here to be money-making machines and blow beer out of our noses. That's what after those young ladies come from the family club. Um, well, they, they, they never heard that. I don't think they heard that. They're not using that slogan anymore. Why not? It's a good one for them. It's what they're doing. Um, we're not here to do that, we're here to do a lot more than that. We're here to prosper as a person in uh, all basic areas of life as much as we can handle. We we'll live fully and richly. We're, we're here to um, flourish uh, as humans fully. Uh, flourish like a flower. Yeah, it's not necessary, they just look nice. And they reproduce. <laughs> <clears throat> just like materialists, they look a lot better, and their lives look more beautiful, and I'm more beautiful. And we define fulfillment, mostly with others. There's National Day of Service today, I hope you did something today. It'll be too cold tomorrow. 
I hope you all keep warm after tonight, they say. At least for the next few days. And, um, yeah, we're here to live the uh, most meaningful life that we can for things that are worthy. I have to find things worthy of dedicating our lives to and live the most meaningful lives that we can in an objective sense. Um, that's in the next issue of my journal, too. Well, okay, that's long enough. I, um, I hope I have provided, as I said, a viable alternative to materialism, uh, materialistic ethics. I hope I have it. I put an easy thing to slap your patience. I appreciate your attendance very much. Thank you very much. And I'll be glad to answer your barrage of questions. I'll try to answer them as directly as uh, I can. And I hope I've stimulated your thinking and your feelings tonight. Thank you very much. Yes, Doug was here. Okay. I hope I speak loud enough over the noise. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so. All right. The question I have for you, Bob, uh, is in that area where we were talking about arguments for intangibles. And you know, you said that uh, non-material reality is what you call personal philosophy. No, no. Uh, wait. Let me finish. Let me finish. And you know, it, 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 you said that personal philosophy guides our uh, lives according to objective value. Thank you. But I think you were trying to get at intangibles, because it was in the section on arguments for intangibles. But I'm saying, my question to you is, I feel that one's personal philosophy could be materialistic. So it wouldn't be strictly intangible. No, but you're right, but that's only a small part of reality as a material part. You know, there's a much bigger part of reality that's intangible, it's not material, it's not physical. At least that's what I've argued and that's what I believe and I think. It's just hard, it's hard to know it, you can't sense it, you can't see it. Touch, taste, smell it. Um, and by the way, if any one of my arguments is correct or sound, then there is an intangible reality. You know, if any one of them are right, I can personally think all six of them are right, but maybe, maybe not. Next question. All right, Margaret. Yeah, um, I have two questions that are related. What is, isn't there another philosophical definition of materialism or materialistic besides the one that you've listed? Yes. And the second question has to do with that. You, you said there was ethical materialism and there was metaphysical materialism, and it wasn't clear to me what the definition was of the second. Metaphysical materialism? You said there was ethical meta and metaphysical materialism. Yeah. Um, my metaphysical materialism is the view that only matter is real. Matter is the only reality. Um, everything else that seems to exist, like God, and yeah, that's really an illusion <laughs> uh, that's created by matter. Mostly they would try to explain ideas, beliefs, like God by means of uh, the brain. I'm saying it's the brain. It's thinking of um, immaterial things, but they only re exist because of our brain. Now, we do need our brains, absolutely, to think, no doubt about that. That's the same thing in the question about materialism, though. Yeah, 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 we need our brains to think. There would be no thinking whatsoever, obviously, <laughs> but uh, for a person. But, but the, the real question is, is our brains enough to explain what's real? That's the question. Uh, explain our brains explain all of reality. No, I think there's much that it cannot explain. We'll never explain. Um, you know, consciousness itself. You can't explain that. 
the metaphysical reality is um, that uh, only matter is real. Matter is the only reality. I didn't really talk about that much at all. I did try to disprove it, though, in my arguments for intangibles. Would you talk about the other definition of materialism? What definition of materialism? You said that, the, 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 I, it's my understanding that there's another philosophical definition of materialism besides the one that you propose. Well, um, besides ethical and metaphysical, and is there a third one you are asking? Oh, those are the two that you're saying there are ethical and material. Uh, yeah, those are the main two, and they can often be confused, um, not clear. Uh, materialism is more my word than, well, I think most people use consumerism. I, I like materialism. I, it work. But yeah, those are the main two. Those are the main okay. you know, it's a, a bit two biggies. Anyhow, Jim? Yes, Jim. Yeah, I want to help my job. Margaret, out. that's a good question she asked because I was thinking the same thing early on. Now, in philosophy, materialism is mentioned many times by different philosophers. Hmm. And they use it different from you use it about the cars and houses and so forth and so on. So I'm 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 jarring jarring your memory because I can't believe you not familiar with those uh, uses of materialism. In, in, in fact, it's a, a philosophy I believe that uh, uh, they re refer to materialism as a, a philosophy, somewhat like they would do pragmatism or positive or, or something like that. Oh yeah, ethical materialism. I call it materialistic ethics is a better one. Because I don't think it's very ethical. And if it results in sheer greed in so many people, how is that ethical? It seems to me to have the opposite result in most people. But, you know, um, um, uh, materialistic ethics is a philosophy applied. Now you can practice that, and many people do today, as your entire philosophy of life. You could say, the greatest good for my life is to acquire more material possessions. And that's what I'm going to do. And that's the most important thing to me, and I'm going to do it. And then, you know, all the other stuff is BS. <laughs> you say, all right, I don't get it. I don't get it. And it's extremely hard. It's not easy. Okay. Tim Bolter. What role does money play in life, then? Uh, needed role, necessary. But it's not enough for the good life for for. for or a truly, um, the most meaningful lives that we can live, it's far from that. We need a lot more than just money. Um, a lot of people just use money as a means to get what they want, get stuff that they want. There's some exceptions to that, of course, there's charity and philanthropy. Um, I think uh, the main role of money is just to enable us to survive. Or we should do a hell of a lot more in our lives than that, though. I really do feel sorry for people who are just trying to survive. And it's a lot of people these days are stuck in that sorry situation because of my generation betrayed our early ideals of hippie don't. <laughs> well, then, uh, huh? You have a question, Brian? Yeah, very sad. Very sad. As a follow-up, and a sad situation now for the poor young people. As <laughs> a can't as find a jobs and good, good pay and can't buy homes because of the greed of my generation, and it's going to, like I say, last for a while. But aren't you just contradicting yourself by saying that, you know, money is not everything, but then at the same time you're saying that you need it to live. Yeah. You need it, but it's not enough. <laughs> That's not enough if you're aiming to live a fully human life, it's just not enough by itself. And I can buy you a lot of fun stuff. And is that why we're here? Oh, I hope we're here for how much? Now. How much is enough then? Uh, enough so you could survive and, um, as my wife Mary would say, not worry about the bills. That's <laughs> we get our show. But, but we pay them and, uh, they're having fun now. Uh, but yeah, pay the bills. <laughs> pay the bills. They're fairly comfortably, why not? Um, 
one say you should uh, deprive yourself too much for don't uh, don't exhaust yourself for materialism that so many people are doing and I would stress yourself Mm. Uh, Russell, I think most of the people working in these crummy jobs just to support their families. They, uh, materialism, half of them can't afford to have, have problems with materialism. They're just struggling enough to make it, to have put a hot roof over their family. Yeah, my students all say that. They say that, and it's very true today. Oh, yeah, I remind them when you had to commute to work, you know, school and work, and uh, you could think during that time. <laughs> you know, you have a lot of time just to reflect. It's not the best situation, but oh, then you could think about other things you want to do uh, than just to survive. In other ways, you could live fully and deeply, uh, although it takes a lot of mental effort. Um, you know, what you said about family? Yeah, a lot of people are killing themselves just to support their family. Um, yeah, it's hard to take that out of materialism, though. Mm. Many it, people, materialism is a luxury they just don't have. Um, no, 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 no. The um, how, how are intangibles a luxury? They don't cost anything. No, but getting, uh, wasting money on material goods. Oh. Uh, a lot of people just can't afford that. They're just surviving out there. No, that's, um, still say it doesn't make it impossible for them to think on their own how there might be more to life. That they still have time to think about it. And the students should pick on their cell phones and stop playing their video games and <laughs> while they're driving. <laughs> And they're always texting too, when they, at least when they stop driving. Um, you know, um, we have time to think, we have time to think about the, the will is lacking, uh, we, we just don't know um, how to go about it, how to go about thinking to come up with more materialism, because materialism is so damn easy and obvious. And like I say, so big with its rewards, and you can keep doing it. <laughs> You know, once it gets old, you can renew it, and it works a little bit. And it's strange, isn't it, how so many people don't just get fed up with it. But the demands of life are so great, and that, um, today, that they don't get tired of materialism, that's all they do. Charlie? Yeah, I'm a little curious here, Bob. You want me to spend the rest of my life, every day now, yeah. grappling with the philosophical question of whether or not God exists. I'm supposed yeah. to do this every day now. At least. At least once a day for about a half hour. Why? You know a bigger question, a better question, a question that's more at well, stake? A thousand better questions. Yeah. <laughs> Name one. Ten thousand. Like Name how one. to get a better job. Give me an example. Try how do I cross the street without getting hit by a car? <laughs> oh, well, you worried about getting hit by a car? Yes. Dead, huh? uh, yeah, that's I worry. an important well, that's question. A question. How do you do it without getting hit by a car? <laughs> that's an important question. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. How do I get home without getting beat up by thugs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, all, they're all revolving around death and uh, avoiding death, and that's what the God question is directly answers. So yeah, I, I hope you will study it. And, yeah, I could go either way, the God question, but but. Um, Questions of my life pick up are very serious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so is eternity. I mean, it's really immortality. If the stories are true, you won't really die. Christianity is the truth, so that's a, look how much time that is. What is it compared to the 80 years we get on earth? That's nothing. So compared to eternity, you don't burn forever, do you? You know, if Jesus was right. Just a follow-up. I can see myself being late for work, and the boss says, why are you late? And I said, I was just trying to know whether or not God exists. Or not. <laughs> Uh, you gotta take, you gotta make the time. You gotta make the time. It's too big to neglect. 
you gotta get to the biggest of now. <laughs> Alright, Gene Horkers. Uh, there have been a uh, atheists who have spoken at the college here. There's probably some atheists in this room. No. Where? Do you, do you believe that some of those people are more, even more ethical than some of the people who claim to be Christians or claim to have a belief in God? Yes or no? Oh, yes. yes Thank they can, you. They can be more ethical, definitely. Thank you. Um, it's not that we know I'll need them. Yeah, I wasn't advocating uh, religious ethics at all. Um, it would have to be independent ethics. It would have to be your own ideas about right and wrong or good. But, um, you know, with this deadly idea of blind faith, a lot of people absolve themselves from coming up with their own answers and blindly follow the church's dictates. And so they don't develop a high ethics. Whereas an atheist is on his own and has to come up with uh, some basis for ethics. And a lot of them don't do that even. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, guess that's enough. Yeah. Uh, that is, uh, if Jesus was the Son of God, uh, why is it that he spent so much of his ministry uh, healing people, uh, dealing with one's the physical one's uh, needs of people? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I was... Why was he dealing with the physical needs of people? I came out of Jewish tradition in which our relation to God was conceived in some very physical ways, very materialistic ways, in the Jewish tradition from which he came out of. So, um, but that might indicate there's a physical afterlife, like a resurrection out of the body. Like... Um, <clears throat> Uh, St. Paul believed in, as you know, you know, he did not believe in the immortality of soul. He believed in the resurrection of a glorified body where we, you don't need physical needs ministered to, though well, if you're glorified. <laughs> or you might, I don't know. I, mean, I think he'd be mostly immaterial, if that's true. Uh, I was, um, just remember, I was hoping, I was hoping there would be more of the atheist regulars here tonight, but not too many are. There. Uh, I guess they don't want to hear the truth. <laughs> oh, so yeah, we're afraid of the truth. Oh, where are they? Oh, yeah. Are they too busy? Oh, the busy. Oh, yeah. oh is they are busy. Right. Mr. Moderator. They're busy doing nothing. Anymore. They're busy following the cereal. Oh, oh, they're on oh, date night. Oh, yeah. They're out buying stuff. Well, he had his hand up first. Oh, did I? Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> Oh, we get ready for rebuttals. Uh, Bob, uh, this is in your area of ethics, specifically uh, on the handouts, so I could uh, orientate you. Uh, it's in Kant's uh, categorical imperative, where you said all ethical actions must be, not should be, but must be universal sizable. <laughs> now, you said it is better to help others than to help or hurt them, and an innocent human life has intrinsic value. And I'm wondering, you know, this uh, universal uh, sizable concept, does it apply to China today? Because I, I don't think human life is that valuable in China. No, 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 no. See, now you're leaving philosophy, though. You're leaving philosophy for a factual description of reality. And philosophy is not that. Science is that. Our philosophy tells us mostly what should be and what ought to be. And what ought to be is that whatever is good in China is also good in here as far as moral actions, not customs and rituals, not that, but moral actions, basic moral actions, ought to be the same in all societies and they ought to be universalizable means you could will that everyone do that same action to you, everyone do it to you. If you could will an action be done to you by other people, Maybe not everybody. <laughs> well, uh, that wouldn't be realistic. But if you could will that, that others do that, an action you're thinking of doing to you, then it's ethical for you to do it. That's what that means, and I, I believe that holds in all cultures for all times. Just like the rules of logic, that's an ethical absolute. That counts. 
Hit upon. Okay. <clears throat> Robert? Oh, no, 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 what? I just waited. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> That's Margaret, I guess. That was one of those basic truths there, Okay. Um, you were, you talked about the following the rules that were in the gospel at one point. No, you said something about the gospel and that there were rules in the gospel that you were supposed to follow. And maybe I misinterpreted or didn't, or, or am I taking it out of context? I don't think I ever advocated that. I was to follow your own ethics, but off your own ethics, okay. your own right. ideas, you know, that's your God would respect. So you, so you don't really look at the Bible and say, well, that doesn't apply to me. Okay. I, I don't. Sorry, Brown, but I don't find the truth in one religion. No religion has all the truth. I have serious questions about if Jesus really was God, and did he really resurrect? There's really very little evidence for that, if you ask me, as far as I could find. Uh, so I think uh, you, um, we need to search all the religions. That's something Charlie could do. Uh, when he pitches work to, you know, to do it, which <laughs> is look into all the world's religions and see what intangible truths they might express. I think all the religions get part of the uh, truth about God, but none of them gets all of it. Uh, mm. Okay, Peter question. Bob, uh, from your study and readings, has there been another culture or era less materialistic than ours or more ethical? Lithuanian. <laughs> 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 you would know the answer to that better than uh, I would, since you have much more thorough knowledge of history than I do. Um, and my good friend David Singer is, is sick tonight, so is his wife Pauline, so they could make but they, they have um, a lot of the historical knowledge, especially David, as a PhD in history. But I would have a hard time thinking of any society that was more materialistic than the U.S., except perhaps uh, uh, ancient Rome, Romans. The end of the early show. You know, we, um, we don't ingest our food and drink our booze and blow it out our nose and then go in the back into a, what do you, what do you call those places in the back? Vomitorium. Vomitorium. What was it, Margaret? Vomitorium. Vomitorium, yeah. We don't have vomitoriums where we go vomit and then eat and drink some more, like the Romans did. But it might be coming on Lincoln Avenue any day soon now, the vomitorium. <laughs> you know, you got this stuff, you know, um, prospering. Um, yeah, maybe the ancient, oh, what would you say, though? Do you know of any culture that was as materialistic as the U.S.? And you know more history than I do, for sure. As a point in time, I think when we were more rural than industrial, when society tipped more to rural than industrial, probably there were less complex and liberal attitudes, so more convention was followed, which for many people was a religion, a conventional religion. Yeah. And cities kind of changed that through diversity. And now materialism is the norm. No, it's become the norm because it's the one that all the diverse cultures can relate to. They can all see these goodies and they all want them, you know. And that's, uh, that's why we've had these waves of immigrants in recent years and a lot of them are disappointed. You know, that, that we've ruined it for everybody. Not everybody, but it made it a lot harder to get materialism by being so greedy with it. You know, Tim Bolger has we're, a burning question. <laughs> we're, we're very, very materialistic society, one of the most. We're way up there with everyone else to ask me. You know, as far as I know, I, I, I pay my tithes, I sacrifice to the altars of the gods, I see. Uh, In the church? I, no, let me finish. I also, um, you know, pay, you know, make a lot of money, put a lot of money into these things for a little payoff. That institution I call the Consumer Electronics Store. 
What about electronic store? I said okay. I call it the consumer electronics store. I go there almost oh. every week with my credit card, pay pay my tithe to the to the gods of the consumers the consumerism. But I find a lot of enjoyment out of the electronics that I purchase. But it still seems like I'm like I'm in a sense dedicated myself to a religion at the same point. Can you comment, please? Yes, I'd like to very good question. But uh, you seem to, to um, you know, in your interest in electronics, to be using it for a good social purpose, like taking the college complex <laughs> yeah, God. and your Toastmasters group, very noble causes. And um, you know, that goes beyond materialism on your part, to have a broader purpose with your moolah. Um, <laughs> but um, that's excellent, and I would encourage others to do it. But the idea to me would be to um, you know, come up with an abstract theory, almost, of, um, of um, <clears throat> what, what, what good you could do um, that doesn't revolve around materialism, or with materialism, more than materialistic. This states some major purposes, in, in words, in your own words. Um, I think that would help us. I'll be more like you, and use our materialism for um, non-materialistic purposes, which I wish a lot more people would do, but sadly, they don't. I don't think. I don't see it. Yes, all right, Gene Holman. Well, I, I believe in materialism um, because uh, through that, we we improve the economy. Yeah. And while we have the economy based on materialism, we have to be materialistic, otherwise we'll lose out on everything. Oh yeah, and that could become a big problem now with the way we've destroyed the environment through greed and waste. Um, we might have to be materialist just to save the environment. Um, I did say that, and I did say that um, materialism can make the earth better. I think we did a good job of that. But, um, but, but we have to have something more than just materialistic survivor surviving. You know, we need more than materialism. I think there is more. And if each person can and should make a guiding philosophy out of it for themselves. Um, <clears throat> try and know and do more. And just something uh, materialistic or physical. Well, Charles? Yeah, getting back to your number one here, I can perceive the cause and effect of virtually everything in the universe. However, you say there is one that I cannot perceive. I can see cause and effect of everything that goes on in the universe. But now you're saying there's one that, for some reason, it is in another category altogether, and we cannot we cannot perceive this. I am kind of inclined to believe that I can. It doesn't exist. It's so unique among all the other cause and effects that we can measure and quantify, and you know, but there's one that doesn't that exclude. I think we should call them forces or powers rather than causes, but um, um, no, um, I'm asking you in my first argument just to carry out the principle of cause and effect. That a cause, force, power is greater and higher than its effects. And and you, it out. you gave an example that I can proceed. Now you're saying, however, there are ones that there is one that I cannot. Might be present. more than one. Oh, there might be more than one. Yeah, you get to higher causes, but 
we eventually have to get to a highest cause and stop there. And the highest cause and the highest power, though, has to be greater than nature, greater than matter. We have a we have a logical and scientific reason for believing that. We're just carrying it out. That's what I'm asking you to do: is extend the cause and effect principle, of basic science, carry that out to all of nature. And what do you have to come up with? Something supernatural, or maybe some things are supernatural levels, non-material levels. You have to come up. You have to. Yeah, you know, that's what I was talking about. You you drawing out to your logical conclusions I, and not stopping, which a lot of people do stop you. when they get the nonsense on their own positions. I'm not accusing you of that. Sorry, go ahead. Are you saying there's causes in the universe that we cannot perceive? Forces, forces, powers. There are forces in the universe that we cannot perceive? Uh, well, they're beyond, they're beyond the universe. <laughs> <laughs> they're beyond, they're greater than the universe. So. Okay. Because uh, causes, causes and forces are greater than oh, okay. greater than their appearance. That principle, basic principle of science. You do away with that, you do away with all scientific progress. The science went nowhere, or very little, didn't go far at all, um, until it got the idea of cause and effect. And then it went really far. So that principle is probably true. Yeah, but we just need to carry it out. Carry it out to its logical conclusion. That there has to be causes greater than nature and matter itself. That's all. That's so hard? Yeah. Hi. Right. Let's go to rebuttals. All right. This is time for the rebuttals. All right. Yay. 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 Bob, you said that uh, there had to be a God for us to have immortal souls. Why are those two <coughs> concepts connected? Couldn't we have immortal souls without a God? Can we? Yeah, Vice that's, versa. that's possible. It's just the way most people think is that, um, <laughs> you know, today the idea of soul it's just kind of beyond comprehension. Uh, it totally goes against our scientific, not factual way of thinking, which is the best we do, in, even through college these days, graduate school in most programs, including philosophy. Um, but yeah, soul, soul is a difficult notion. Maybe there is a soul, maybe there's an intangible of the soul. Um, but most people associate the afterlife with God. You know, and God's going to give them the afterlife if they just don't hurt all this. That was Bob's point. Hope you enjoy it. <laughs> now, if they associate the two together these days, God, God and uh, um, <clears throat> immortality as a way of beating death, <clears throat> that you're too busy to think about. They don't want to think about it. it's too disgusting anyway. <laughs> so, so yeah, but your view is um, more independent and more original. And um, if you have good evidence for souls, I'd like to hear it. All right. Mm -hmm. Definitely. All right, let's it's go to rebuttals. Today. Rebuttals. All right, let's sing them again. About How five. many here have enlightenment instead of raw on the rest of us? One, right, two, good. three, four, five, six, uh, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, uh, at least. All five right. minutes, Brom. Five. There'll be more. There'll be about five minutes each. Yeah, five Initially. Minutes. I'm going to be contemplating this. Oh, All God. Right. <laughs> All right, our first one. <laughs> Uh, uh, Joe Mayer. Got to do a little every day, you know, Margaret, every day. My, um, early on in my life, I formulated an image of uh, philosophers. And it was someone who was sitting in a Buddha-like position, rocking back and forth, mumbling to himself or herself, and chuckling often. 
and I present company accepted. Um, materialism is of prime importance. And if you don't believe me, you can ask Mitt Romney and all of the other psychopaths who run our country. In our era, materialism is not the necessities of life, for example, food, uh, housing, transportation, including automobiles, uh, human contact and jobs. Those are, that is not materialism if we need it. That is something we need to live. It's not something we, materialism to me is something that is beyond that, just as God is beyond comprehension. Um, but even Mitt Romney and the other psychopaths are, cannot conceive of truth, beauty, and love. They are not, it, it, it escapes them completely because of the nature of a psychopath. Now, in the, a matter of cause and effect, um, I think that cause is, could be better defined as opportunism. Um, ideas, the concept of ideas, very few ideas are preferred by dead people. They, they don't come across very well. But there are some ideas that are, that are developed by non-human animals. And uh, we, we find that by observing the animals themselves. Uh, the productive working class has been deprived of uh, materialism and uh, philosophy. They don't have time for it. Um, I remember in, eight, I wasn't there, in the late 1870s, a German philosopher wrote a book called The Philosophy of Poverty. Karl Marx wrote another essay in response to that. It was entitled The Poverty of Philosophy. Now, on intangible ideas, uh, the uh, theoretical physicist Richard Feynman uh, once said, and I'm paraphrasing here, yeah. if someone tells me that they understand uh, quantum mechanics, I know he's lying. Um, on the meaning of life, uh, in my opinion, and many other people, it's the struggle that we go through to make life better for those who come after us. Um, with the exception of those of us who attend the college of complexes on a regular basis, um, we are exposed to the ideas, the analyses, and the delusions from a diversity of uh, thinking human beings. Thank you. A uh, few of you have noticed that at the beginning of the meeting, uh, somehow I managed to upset Doug. And uh, I apologize to the group because that could have been very disruptive. And uh, I also want to apologize to Doug because my intention is, uh, definitely is not to make him sick is to, I try to make people think, and so when I uh, poke on people, it's, it's in that, it's with that intention. Yeah. So, um, in the future, I hope that uh, I'll be more sensitive to see when people are getting off the handle. Uh, we need a lot of thinking about this, and I think what uh, the speaker said today was a lot of BS. <laughs> he repeated the same thing over and over and over and over. You can say the same thing in two minutes and, and go into something more profound. We, our, the meaning of life, as, as uh, the previous uh, uh, rebuttal was, uh, is the meaning of things to leave this world better than we found it. Actually, we are not doing that. Uh, the potential is, and very clear, and an imminent potential is that we leave a world that is not inhabitable by humans as we have been doing it for a long time now. Uh, the, uh, the chemistry of the sea is being disrupted to tremendous levels where uh, little creatures that they are the foundation of the food chain 
are not able to form their shells, which means a collapse of life in the whole sea. Uh, we, we are really, really screwing up. Uh, at the same time, we keep listening to the, the this, this, that there are forces out of this universe, you know, that is a God that you have to pay attention to, and it will guide you. It's just absolute nonsense. No two ways about it. And so, uh, the, the, point, the point that I think we should concentrate is into paying attention to science, to understand the science that is the foundation of how the world works, to put, not only pay attention, understand it, but then go along with the measures that could change the results of what we're doing, which is continuing burning the fossil fuels to the point that it will be no return. Now, potentially, we will be raising the temperature of the air by 10 degrees, not 2 degrees. And this is almost inescapable now. Now, can you imagine? Uh, Chris Hedges says in his latest article, he said that we need two things to confront this. One is intellectual integrity. Intellectual integrity means that we do put attention to the science, that we put an effort in understanding the science. And then is emotional integrity. That's very difficult because how do we confront the fact that our children are going to live in a miserable, impossible world that we left for them? I have a 24-year son, and I couldn't imagine the suffering that he and his descendants will be suffering. That's very difficult to confront. But unless we have the integrity to confront that, then how are we going to take measures to correct that? We are going to keep thinking about this God or the other God or, or whatever bullshit you want to think about it, but we are not confronted the reality of the world that we live in here. So this is what I want to leave with you. Think about how do you can affect the positive change in the future and forget about all this mumbo jumbo, whether it is or is not a God here or there. I believe it's uh, back to Lichtenberg. Mm -hmm. I was once uh, part of the secret group, the philosophical group that met once a month, once a client, sometimes I to uh, philosophize and solve the problem. Now, uh, uh, the speaker. Dr. Lichtenberg, he knows, like I know, that he is not a oral, or, or, uh, that he's not, he's not a, when he reaches his podium, he's not Martin Luther King when he's speaking. He's not yeah. President Clinton when he's speaking. But I've read some of his papers when the philosophical group meet in Chicago no. once a year, he has presented some papers. The man is not a lightweight when it comes to philosophy. I'm familiar with philosophy. I love philosophy. Because when I found out that philosophy was the pursuit of wisdom and the pursuit of truth, I said, shit, this is my thing. And I started with the pre sacratic like Thales, Heraclitus, Democritus. And I came all the way up to Marcuse and whoever else you can name. I'm familiar with philosophy. I say, and I didn't say this before, that I'm a self-proclaimed amateur philosopher. And one of the reasons I like philosophy is many reasons. But one of the reasons I like philosophy, they don't tell you, give me four more years, 500 more years, I'll have this straightened out for you. A philosopher is not like that. 
a philosopher talks about what the fuck he knows, what he's capable of knowing. He knows his limitations and he knows his ability. It's the propagandist and the guy in charge that come up with the bullshit. Materialism is taught. Consumerism is taught. What the people is trying to get over, the naturalness of what human being is about. We don't need nobody to tell us about a lot of things like Emmanuel can't say. A lot of things we know a priori. Other people have said that even Plato believed that we had innate ability. You don't need nobody to hold your hand and tell you this and so forth and so on. <clears throat> Philosophy is the foundation of whatever man is trying to do intellectually, even scientifically. I don't understand anybody that can't see this in philosophy. Something else could be, should tell you that philosophy must be something because the guy in charge don't push that on you because philosophy is an individual effort. You have to think that for yourself. Ain't nobody put their hand on your head and say you're a philosopher now. But thinking is individual. And the guy that wants to use you don't want you thinking. So we don't push philosophy in. And for anybody get up here, somebody might have mentioned already about philosophy's nonsense, especially, specifically, metaphysics. Oh, you're late. And my, uh, uh, David Hume, Augusta Cox, they said long time ago that metaphysics is a bunch of shit. So it ain't nothing new about the attack on philosophy. But there are also people that become hundreds of years and years after one another that accepted <laughs> the philosophy of his predecessor to a degree. They don't imi uh, imitate one another because they're not interchangeable. Marx, for instance, has, you can see Hegel in Marx's uh, philosophy and theory, but he's not interchangeable with Hegel. You have heard of German idealism, Kant, Hegel, Fiche, Shelley, uh, these people are not interchangeable. That's another thing I like about a philosopher. Ain't no one of them claim, I got the answer, you got blah, blah. It ain't nobody selling one philosopher like they'll pick out of Stephen Hawking or Einstein and give you his, give you, he know everything. Fuck it, he pushing up the ground. He pushed up daisies so he don't know how to stay out of Rose Hill, so he must not know everything. He's a man with limitation. Philosophy teach you uh, 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 that lesson. And it teaches you how to be free and how to be an individual. Materialism, consumerism is taught by the few to make the few rich. Material is uh, uh, what the professor's trying to get over here. It's natural. A human being should be, <laughs> should be dying to get where the professor want you to be, or where you should want to be, and that is to free, to do your own goddamn thinking, and stop people from telling you what to buy, when to buy, and what's good and what's bad. Because if they knew that, then they would stay out of Rose Hill Cemetery. <laughs> so they must have limitation, and that same dude that can't stay out of Rose Hill Cemetery, he ain't never showed me that he could walk on water, so what is he, what does he mean? Okay, thank you. Well, I guess I'll start out with a little bit of a joke. I won't go to Rose Hill Cemetery. When I die, and I think I will, I will go to the University of Chicago, University of Illinois. And that's where my body goes. Uh, I like uh, the professor's speech in two important ways. He gave us his ideas in writing, and then he stuck to those ideas in his talk. So I think that was very, very good. That really helps us when that happens. I, his talk made me think of two uh, books that I've read, and of course, if he looked at them, he might think differently. But one is Why America Failed by Morris Berman. It's from a historical point of view, not from a philosophical point of view. And it takes only a segment of what he's talking about. But uh, Berman would agree with, with 
Dr. Lichtenberg, a lot of the things he, he said. The other book is, uh, that I would recommend is uh, Mortimer Adler, Six Great Ideas. We talked about these six ideas uh, in this talk, so if you get, ever get a chance, I would pick up that book. I've read it twice, I need to read it again, I'm slow. Uh, I would say I differ with the professor on a few things. One thing is I believe I know many, many people, myself included, who are not totally dedicated to slavish uh, uh, looking at a set religion or uh, slavishly running after stuff. Uh, I am not one of those people. Yes, I've got material things, but if somebody gave me a million dollars, to be frank, I try to get rid of it. I don't need that. I've got more than I need. And certainly more books than I need. So I, I think there are many, many people like myself who are in that category. I know them personally. They're not rushing after things. Uh, they're not uh, just obeying a religion without thought. Uh, so I think there are probably more of these people than some of us may imagine. Thank you. Yes, I appreciate uh, my good friend Bob's talk. Uh, I want to defend him. Uh, um, Bob doesn't only think about these things that he talked about tonight. Uh, he does think a lot about global warming and uh, the environment and uh, other important topics like that. And indeed, we had a uh, meeting. Uh, Bob sometimes has uh, um, brings together not only the Seekers group, but a group, a smaller group of us, to uh, meet and talk about urgent uh, topics of the day. Uh, and the last uh, meeting that we had was devoted to global warming and the ethics of what a person, an individual person, could do about it. So. I just want to bring that up. Uh, uh, there's so many things uh, going on. Uh, it's impossible for one individual to involve himself or herself with every one of them all the time. But uh, I would like to suggest, though, that uh, Bob might amend his um, stricture that uh, uh, people devote a half hour of their life to thinking about the existence of God, since that's such a topic that's been beaten to death so much. He might ex consider relaxing his rule and extending it to that everyone try to devote a half hour of their time to thinking about important issues of the day or important philosophical and or ethical issues, including things like how to respond to global warming, which, you know, from a practical standpoint might be more, more important than knowing whether God exists or not, since I don't think we're ever going to come to a conclusion of that question. Uh, however, uh, to move on a little bit, so... Uh, I'm glad to see that you added to your repertoire of uh, talking about things like quantum mechanics and uh, like the imaginary number, uh, which is one of my favorite intangibles and uh, <laughs> as uh, being uh, something that, um, uh, an idea that clearly exists and uh, that is used by nature and been used by nature at least since the Big Bang, probably uh, um, used in other universes outside our own uh, and um, that um, is not something material itself but uh, and uh, the wave functions that uh, are um, clearly uh, not material themselves but they, they represent particles which are material so so there's a um, there's that, that are, there is that interesting juxtaposition of things there and uh, clearly these are very uh, interesting topics to think about. Um, the idea of consciousness, which you brought up, is very important. Uh, we don't know uh, how that uh, quality exists in um, us humans, most of us humans. I mean, sometimes we wonder about some of our Republican friends, uh, whether they really have consciousness or not. Um, they oh, They certainly do not have consciences. Oh, sorry, I got those confused a little bit. Anyway, some of them may not have consciousness. You're trying, You're right. <laughs> some of them might not, might not be entirely human, but um, the way some of our humans uh, uh, treat other humans, maybe it's not. We should we should worry about being ethical humans rather than just being human, of course. So, 
Uh, and that was part of the, the topic of the uh, talk tonight, which uh, involved a lot of things and, and gave us a lot of good food for thought. Um, as far as whether we have uh, immortal souls, I'm on the fence on that issue. I just don't know. Um, I, I, again, I, I don't know whether we need a God to Im imbue us with immortal souls. That might be something that actually comes about um, as some kind of a deeper mystery um, that uh, arises from the emergent uh, uh, quality of consciousness, um, which there might be another level to reality, um, uh, not just quantum mechanics. There might be something um, of, of a deeper or a more profound level, uh, something besides um, uh, simply the, the uh, physical laws that we've discovered so far. So uh, the jury is out on that. Um, and there is uh, some evidence for the possibility of uh, souls existing, but um, it's um, not uh, it's not completely definitive yet. But um, uh, that, that would be a. Could you repeat the last of what existing? A uh, soul. Oh, okay. Yeah. What evidence? There's evidence of possibilities of uh, that actually ghost-like entities do exist. That's not true. But it's not definitive, and it's not, it's not convincing. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, I just want to start by uh, <coughs> following up to what uh, Wade Frank uh, opened his talk uh, rebuttal by apologizing to me for upsetting me and he was going to watch his uh, language in the future or, or choice of topics. I remember my ex-wife said the most controversial topics you can always have in a group is sex, religion, and politics. And uh, I, I, I firmly agree with her that religion isn't one of the topics to really debate about or sex. Politics is another matter, it's more objective. But uh, also I would like to say is that I, I've heard from some people that uh, they objected some of Frank's language and they, and they started to stop coming to the college and uh, the word that uh, bothers them uh, is in the third person of the verb to know, uh, shio. Uh, and that's a shio in the first person is I know, shis is in the second person, you know, and shit is in the third person of he, she, it knows. So uh, when Frank says that, uh, we should all think that he's referring to that word rather than the S-H-I-T word. Uh, having said that, I'm going to go on uh, with my uh, rebuttal here. Uh, I think Bob did a a good job in putting this flyer together and the comments and everything. You know, I uh, joined him on the last Friday of the month uh, at the Seekers, and you know, we're used to hearing uh, statements and then we debate them. Uh, one of the things uh, uh, I'm going to debate him on or support him on is the criticism of materialistic ethics. Uh, in the handout, he said extremely narrow and shallow not fulfilling, overly competitive, destructive and wasteful uh, of the environment, largely pointless and empty. And I have to refer to Jesus. I know a lot of you don't like to hear about religion quotes, but in the Gospels it said, uh, Jesus says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Now that's, uh, that, that's uh, buried in scripture, but there was a movie that came out in 1968, I believe, or even earlier than 67. Uh, it was called The Man for All Seasons, uh, where it was a story about um, uh, Thomas More uh, and the trial that he went through uh, for not granting uh, Henry VIII a divorce from, I think, Catherine of Aragon. And in there, there was a character by the name of Rich. And uh, there was something that Rich was testifying against Thomas More. And uh, Rich told a big lie in the trial. And then when uh, Rich was passing Moore, who was uh, in the courtroom, Moore asked Rich to come a little closer. He 
picked up this medallion and he asked uh, Rich about the medallion and he said uh, that he had been given uh, a Chancellor of Wales, I guess. And then uh, Thomas Moore said to him, uh, sir, uh, in response said, uh, Rich, is it worth your soul for Wales? Sort of supporting what Jesus had said. Um, the yeah. other thing uh, is uh, that there were a couple of questions that I, I had uh, regarding uh, the arguments for intangibles. One was intangible standards and absolutes must as a, exist as a condition for manner to exist. Uh, without these, the world would be completely uh, chaotic. I didn't quite understand that uh, at face value. Maybe in the rebuttal, uh, Bob can comment on that. The other one is in number six, where he talked about intangibles, abound in math and currently uh, in physics uh, in the universe. Well, I I uh, crossed out intangibles and I used the word abstractions. You now, Bob was saying to us earlier, you know what, uh, you know that three is intangible, but we know that in abstractions and math, they represent reality. And you know, we, you know, we learn from little kids when we're in first grade, you know, you hold up three fingers, they have three objects, and you add two, if you count them all up, you have five. And I also say that, you know, uh, they also uh, exist in reality. You know, we have surveyors out there and they can measure heights and angles with their equipment. Uh, another uh, item I want to bring up before I run out of time, I don't know where I'm at, but you know, we were talking about Jesus uh, earlier and his actions, but really they were miracles. These were extraordinary events. Uh, one of them we have today, I, had, I went to church earlier before I came here, and it was about Jesus turning water into wine. Uh, Cana. And it was very good wine, too, from ordinary water. Thank you. Nice to see everybody again. Uh, yeah, I, I like the philosophical talks, and uh, most of this intangibles, I, I pretty much agree with that, and uh, they are good. Uh, truth, ideas, reason, goodness, language, justice, love, beauty, peace, self, uh, soul, mind, free will. But uh, I feel we can have all this without God. That's just uh, what I'm thinking now. But uh, uh, actually, frankly, I'm not against God and uh, I'm not uh, excluding God. I just think uh, if God exists, it has a uh, superpower. It cannot be proved by scientific method. So it's uh, beyond uh, all our capabilities and uh, we just uh, have no, no way to influence God. God can influence us, but we couldn't influence God. And uh, so to me, I haven't heard God talking to me, so I I just assume there's no, but I'm still waiting and uh, looking, and uh, if uh, I feel God talk, talks to me, then uh, I'll believe it, and uh, God can probably make make me uh, behave uh, a, a true religion uh, believers. So I'm not really worry about whether God is there or not. Right now I just assume not because I haven't heard anything. I didn't feel anything. Maybe Professor heard something so he said that we have to think about the God and uh, obviously uh, Professor hasn't heard enough that which God or so far there are so many God that which one is the true God or none of them. So uh, I think I, I won't spend a uh, half hour every day to think about that question. Uh, out of all this uh, intangibles, actually I'm uh, thinking to other uh, behaviors. I, I, I bothers me quite a bit nowadays. Uh, 
why is uh, like uh, in this society people like to watch the sports channel to see the sports compete in different uh, ways and uh, uh, today I read the news Armstrong is uh, being interviewed and uh, he said he, he just like to compete for his life and uh, he was regarded uh, a superman and everybody admired uh, but now it's different so I, I don't know how, how this competition, how this winning mentality helps the society, how much helps and, uh, and uh, nowadays uh, like uh, Congress also has this very strong winning society mentality and the beat the others and the competition between two parties and uh, ignore what the people need. Uh, I think that's a uh, that's just too much. When you get really involved in the competition for no reason, and uh, then you got into drugs, uh, just, uh, like Armstrong did. Another is uh, uh, maybe related to the beauty here. Uh, art. Uh, people like to listen music, good music, good painting, watch good movies. Uh, to me, I, I, since I was a child, I tried to resist that. Although sometimes, uh, oh, the, it's, it's good picture, good things. But I try to resist uh, those art to have any real impact on me. I won't feel, I, I, I feel I shouldn't be happy just because I listen to good music and uh, I should be happy because I did something good. If I didn't do anything good, I just listen to music, I feel be happy, I, I, I may just uh, have some cocaine or drug and then I'll be very happy. So, uh, but art of course now is a big industry. And, uh, uh, so, those uh, art, beauty, all the ladies like fashion, and uh, all the men like uh, uh, sports. And uh, to me, I, I I still don't have a good feeling about how they how they should be valued. The meaning of life is a rather simple one. I think Ivan Boski made it real clear, and he said, greed is good. <laughs> Never underestimate the power of enlightened self-interest, for it is what guides and runs all of our lives to a large extent. Why is it that meatpackers get up, or certain people get up at 4 a.m. in the morning? to come to market to bring their goods to work. They do it because they make a little money. Money may not be the end all, the be all of things, but it certainly provides a certain level of comfort and a certain level of being that makes life a lot easier to, to deal with. Many of us go to work because we want to to live a little bit better life, and that means to have a more comfortable existence for most of us. Whether it be through prestige or snob appeal, the American marketplace has a need that everybody can fulfill, and yes, even in the markets of religion it has the same thing. The freedoms that we have today with the freedom of religion, freedom of press, and freedom of assembly are guaranteed by our Constitution, and that in and of itself is a philosophy of life, that mankind should live free to pursue their own happiness. But for me, I choose something a little bit different. The whole meaning of my own existence itself is that of an enlightened self-interest. What that simply means to me is that if you live in a moral and ethical manner, don't hurt others, and try to do your best to do some good in the world with the resources you have, you've got about, I think, three quarters of it right. Even Solomon, in the book of Ecclesiastes, said, to, said over and over again, 
Vanity of vanities, all is vanity, but is it but a chasing after the wind. But in Solomon's time, the kingdom of Israel rose to very good high economic prosperity. So it may not have been a chasing after the wind, as he said. Many people benefited from his 60 years of peace and benefited from the general material well-being of that time. Israel went from the Iron Age to the Bronze Age in that period of time during his reign. And yet, he was the same guy who wrote that book, Vanity of Vanities, all is a striving and a chasing after the wind. And he concludes his book very kind of philosophically for, what is it? For the, for the work of man is unceasing, and much study wearies the body. Here is the end of the matter. Here is the conclusion of all things. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the sum of the whole existence of man. Church in the morning. Yeah, that's the <laughs> Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, I'm glad that uh, Bob acknowledged that atheists uh, can be moral. That's, that's something that is nice that, or, or is, um, is hopeful in the sense that some people just categorically deny that. Um, that uh, people cannot develop a personal ethical philosophy using their minds and reason and knowledge of history and social dynamics and science and uh, philosophy to devise a personal code of ethics and a, and a morality of behavior towards other people. These, co these codes developed over the millennia because we, we lived in small groups. We were hunter-gatherer societies uh, for those of you who don't believe in evolution, <laughs> at any rate, the last 200,000 years, more or less, Homo sapiens lived in small hunter-gatherer groups, and you really couldn't just wake up in the morning and murder your, your brother or um, beat your kids to death, because the group itself suffered when you did that. Uh, and you needed to do things altruistically to um, ensure the group's survival. And so all of these kinds of ethical and moral behaviors really did develop over, over the millennia for, for how we live. Actually, we even see altruistic behaviors in, in, in a lot of animals. So um, it's not something that has to do with religion or a god. Now there are approximately there are maybe more than five thousand religions known, if not the, more than that, and probably there are uh, seven hundred and fifty billion concepts of God, each one varying according to the individual who's living on the earth today. And, you know, it's, it's, it got us sort of a figment of our imagination, in my opinion. And we created God, God did not create us. And if we say that God exists separately and there are forces that exist outside of the universe and all of, all of that, I think we have to, with it, the burden of proof is on the person who claims the existence of that. I do not have to prove that something doesn't exist. You have to prove that your claims do exist. So I really reject all of that. I think it's a, it's a crock. And I also think that people who really believe in God really say that I believe in God and therefore I am right. And this righteousness really um, it, 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 it makes worse the kinds of really negative human um, qualities we have uh, to oppress people, uh, oppression of women, oppression of poor people, seeing in this country one of the major failures of religion is this gospel of prosperity, that if you send money to the church you're going to be rewarded and God will make sure that you become wealthy. Now that's probably a literal quote from a lot of these tele-evangelists that are making millions of dollars um, uh, preaching the gospel on the television, um, I just remember uh, a guy wearing a t-shirt that had red and black and green on it, and he said he was sideswiped by Tammy Faye. 
So, um, and, and you know, all this stupidity that's, that's around this very public religion, that, that, that the, the idea of God is really used to make a lot of money, and air-conditioned dog houses and all those other things, while people were starving because, because they sent their social security check. So, um, I, I, you don't need the supernatural. Um, I can't even read my own writing here. There is no scientific evidence of a soul. I, you know, come on, please. There was like, well, the, you know, the body weighs two tenths of a of a milligram less at when the person breathes out his last. I mean, you know, that's that's absolutely nothing. Um, okay, so basically, that the whole the whole thing in in the in the in the Christian in the development of Christianity in this country really had a great deal to do with the development of slavery as an institution, with the, with the racism and oppression of um, people of color in this country, with the oppression of women, with uh, the oppression of people who are in poverty, of that divide and conquer, and keeping people subservient and um, on the bottom so the few people could make the money on the top. Those uh, structures were reinforced by religion, and for, and that is one of the reasons that I really reject it altogether. All right, thank you, Bob. Uh, put together a nice lecture there on the handout too. In a very central, important topic, each facet of our lives. I'll be eclectic as usual. I approach this from a totally different perspective. Um, the humans, humans are a different species altogether. Um, and as we, 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 we have this thing, I'm gonna get to it called humanism. And the rest of the species in nature are governed by utilitarian materialism. Or Darwinism. Uh, you were showing me, Diana, where the, the the cavemen decorated their cave with paintings. It's going to be at the museum. Uh, the other species don't do that. They don't have any element of intangibles, and and it's strictly utilitarian <coughs> material existence. Uh, there may be some aspects of other species, but no great presence, perhaps caring for the young, we kind of think, or maybe a little altruism, but no really these, this aspect of our species that I don't know how to categorize. I will categorize it by the term humanism. I think rather than your categories here in intangibles, you're focusing on intangibles. And I would say the thing that differentiates us is this humanistic feature. I mean, the species has a culture. No other species has a culture. No other species has a heritage. No other species has concern about the future. Um, we have intellects that do this. And language is just a vehicle for doing so. That doesn't establish anything unique or prove anything whatsoever. I'm sorry, I've seen those linguistic stuff. Now, whether some people are concerned about this or not, this humanistic element that began in the Erasmus, I like the term better. That's why there's an American Humanist Association. Uh, yeah, you can spend a lot of time, and I call it people who are narrow skill. Or you can be broad skill. Um, quite frankly, where's Frank? Were it not for the intangibles and the humanism, I really, should, I really don't have any obligation to what happens to the world after I pass away. There's not going to be any shortage of materials. I gave that thing until about 2040. I have no obligation to the next generation with the exception of this obligation imposed through these intangibles. And quite frankly, so what? What can I do? Why should I be concerned? 
you know, these are perplexing questions that we have to answer, but um, that's what I mean. And the larger thing, are we going to be concerned about these or unconcerned? That's what I mean. The narrow scope person says, so what? Look today, you know, the broad scope. I'm somewhat raising these issues. And I'm going to jump around a little bit. You gave, you gave us these six things here. I'm going to get rid of four of them. I think number two is kind of interesting that there's some and there's standards for existent material stuff in there's are you saying there's laws to the universe? I agree. There are laws to the universe. Do those laws establish anything? Quite exactly it establishes that there's absolutely no design to the universe. I mean the moral of these laws of the universe we discover, the farms I think the more we're ascertaining here. It's a fairly chaotic thing in a lose any any centralized process of design. The process of discovery is still in progress. But I found number two intriguing. I kind of like that one. Number five, there are constraints of us. Intangibles put constraints on us. I don't know about that one, but interesting to think about it. Now the one thing about that you hit on here in ethics is that the 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 situation the thing here that is called the you didn't give it much coverage here is the categorical imperative, which means are we guided by the larger perspective of rules of extending over time and without limits? And I like that idea. I've always had since I first found out about it or read about it. I think that's governing now. An aeroscope person is bound by narrow situational ethics. What is the best thing, perhaps, for me in this situation? Um, and in that sense, yeah, I, I, I think that's where we're, we have to focus on in the direction we have to head. I don't know what else I was going to talk about here. Oh, the other thing, what's this stuff about winners and losers? <laughs> I mean, you know, I've been talking about that for years, you know. I mean, I was thinking about, that's a good category. Are you a winner or a loser, man? <laughs> I mean, you should see the losers that come into my office sometimes. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, would you Peter, first? Peter, I took your next. 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 First, I would like to thank Frank for a very interesting presentation. I wasn't going to speak tonight, but I heard something that was said earlier by a previous rebutter that disturbed me. We do very much have an obligation to those generations that will follow us. As to, yes, we do. As to the stewardship we take of this planet, as to what we do with its resources, I'm sorry. I don't happen to have any children, but I have a close friend who does. And uh, she and her husband and their children from both their previous marriages, they're going to inherit this planet after we're all gone. And I would hope that this planet would be left in some kind of decent condition uh, for them to be able to live a happy and a useful life on it. Why? Without Charlie, you had your chance. One fool at a time. <laughs> Give us a reason why. As I said, I would hope that we would take proper care of this planet and leave it, and leave it so that we could pass it on to our descendants. As Dr. Ro otherwise, as Dr. Roger Charlier who taught for many years at Northeastern Illinois State University, and who I heard speak at, uh, on the very first Earth Day in 1970 at Evanston Township High School, where I was then a freshman. As he put it then, mankind will not end with a, with a blast or a whimper, but with a gasp. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, w I want to thank Bob because of uh, not just tonight, but for 20 years now he's been leading leading uh, talks or what I like to think 
more abstractly is elevating people in Chicago, or anyone who wants to join. And he's put a lot of time in these preparations, I know. And uh, trying to lift us from the politics of the men, mundane, I call it, which usually is fashionable or trendy, one political candidate from another, but always Bob has tried to refocus us away from some political issues and into always the arts, and I know he stands for uh, public service in some way or building community. And he might do that by bringing us to a film or a supper club that he creates, but he never gives up trying to elevate or cause us to seek for ourselves. And uh, I give him a hand for that for so many years. So thanks, Bob, for that. Speaker gets the last word. Oh. oh, I have a couple of remarks to I think that you should not worry too much about souls. You are souls. And, 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 and Jesus was very much concerned about your souls, that is, your personalities, your feelings, your attitudes, and your physical bodies. Yes, he was materialistic in that way. But, like uh, Bob's topic, uh, there was a whole lot more than materialism uh, in Jesus' thinking. And I think that there probably is in some of your thinking I, I I don't even uh, believe that Charlie is completely honest with himself. When he says that he's not concerned about anything that uh, might uh, happen after he's gone. Uh, I, I think that he's concerned about people and uh, that he uh, has a uh, respect for people and uh, ideas and feelings and attitudes and so on. And I think that uh, he tries the best he can uh, to, uh, to express that. And uh, I, I think that that's what all of us atheists, you know, we're all atheists, whether you're, you know, every Christian is a self-confessed atheist, you know, but we, we know that we are apart from God, that we are uh, offending God, that we fall short of what the God who loves us wants us to be and feel and do. So, uh, I hope that uh, we uh, would be, uh, Marx was a, a historical materialist, uh, but he was not a vulgar materialist, and he denounced vulgar materialism. Anyway, uh, I, I, I hope that that we go beyond uh, materialism, uh, but uh, that uh, we also uh, see uh, the material reality, of, uh, what reality there is uh, to our ma merely materialist concept of okay. Thank you. I like materialism. Oh, Bob, you get the last word. So do I. Stuff. Yeah, I like Bob I like gets the last word. <laughs> gold. You're gold. Let's just say you get so I'll do good with it. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, for your feedback.
I appreciate it, and I'll give a lot of thought to <clears throat> a lot of what you said. I've written the main points down. I will respond to the main ones now. Um, <clears throat> um, yes, we should make life better. Um, I can't read my writing now. Um, because it's too damn dark up here. <clears throat> I still have Doug's flashlight, plus my own. Um, but materialism has made it a lot worse. As Joe Mayer and Francisco says, I repeated too much. I think I repeated very little. I repeated some for emphasis. I give you a lot of information, a lot of different arguments, a lot of ideas, abstract, complex ideas, not simple ones. I try to make them as simple as I could, so I hope you don't feel too overwhelmed by it. Maybe you'll Keep going back to the handouts, which are a way of taking something away. Usually they don't take anything away but the vaguest recollections. Uh, I know I would. <clears throat> um, yeah, we should uh, try to understand science more, implores, implores Francisco. Yes, I agree. We need to make a positive change in the world, and we need to use science. I did badmouth science too much because I'm jealous of its success, but it was too successful. And uh, it became synonymous with knowledge, and it's not, not at all. It's only a small part of our knowledge, and, then, and it's only one about the materialistic world. Um, so we do not need to understand science better and apply it better to the world. But um, words like mumble jumble and BS are just name calling, name calling epithets. They're called in logic, they're fallacies. Um, intangibles are needed to make the biggest changes, which is in, is in our minds. That's what we really need to change. As Einstein said, well, now that we got the nuke, uh, uh, everything's changed. Everything's changed except our way of thinking. No, we're still stuck before the Middle Ages. I wish we were before the Middle Ages, but because that was a classical period, it was a lot better. But yeah, we need to um, not neglect the big ideas and make big changes on our minds in the minds of other people. Gene Anderson said that I should be more like Martin Luther King as a speaker. Yeah, yeah absolutely right. I should try and get more fervor into my talk uh, because I think it is as important as what he talked about. Um, so I hope you enjoy the holiday on Monday if you get the day off. Philosophy is the foundation of all our knowledge, and definitely, indeed. Um, it teaches us to think for ourselves. Uh, Gene Horcher says, uh, uh, if you had a million dollars, you'd get most of it away because you couldn't even spend that much money in your life. <clears throat> and he knows a lot of people would do likewise. Well, okay, I have anecdotal evidence for that. I'm just looking around. There are no surveys, no Gallup polls on materialism, materialistic attitudes. Um, so maybe I am overgeneralizing. Hmm. Uh, release you off from half an hour a day, restriction, to try and know whether God exists or not, and whether we can have a relationship to God. I don't think I release that, um, because I do think we get clarity, we get better ideas about God, and it can go either way. It can go either way. I don't think it's a waste of time. It's an important part of time, because it's... Like I say, the biggest question of them all... Um, <clears throat> <coughs> uh, vanity of vanity as well as vanity, yeah, materialism is true, it's all vanity, it's all vanity. <clears throat> all right, it could be a little bit more. How many gods are there, Margaret asked? Well, 500, and who, yeah, it depends how you count, what's a god. There are 10 to 12 world's religions, and even that depends on... Well, there's 5,000. No, no, world religions, world religions are religions that are open to all people. Um, not just their tribes or their nation or their members, 10 or 12 world religions, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, things of I can't name them all right now, it's too late. Uh, this generally recognized to be 10 or 12, but um, never confuse religion though with God, especially your conception of God, your most rational conception of God, what, what God is, and whether or not God indeed even exists. It's a question that will take all our lives, and we should try to know it as best we can every day. And Charlie points out there, 
art is not uh, utilitarian. Uh, paintings, paintings in caves have no practical purpose whatsoever. Uh, although they could be used for that, but they're, they're just appreciated and enjoyed for themselves because we like looking at them, we like perceiving them, we like sensing them. They have no practical purpose. And that just shows how um, important intangibles are to us, humans. Um, that's just in one area, it's true in every area. There are lots of designs I disagree with Charlie due to the laws, which he agrees that there are laws. Um, um, the Urgent Supper is held on the second Wednesday every night at Capers, you're all invited. We have the best conversation on the planet. Um, <clears throat> that are talking philosophy and emerging problems. Um, and certainly a better conversation than you and I could have at our, uh, at our suppers at home. <laughs> you know, it's a lot better for me, a lot better than they had over there blowing their beer out their nose all night. Which I doubt they'd get that in anyway. The jokes for that good. Um, what truly is the big question, my last part? What's the big question? Is the material world the biggest question and how we can make it better? Or um, <clears throat> um, is the biggest question we got in this um, immaterial, intangible realm? Um, I think the intangibles are much bigger uh, because <clears throat> they're about um, the um, the biggest part of ourselves, the biggest aspects of our lives, the tangible questions are only about the physical aspects, and that's it. No more. But yet, there really is a lot more to life. And uh, I hope you all will uh, think about them more, um, because uh, really we have to have clearer ideas, you know, if we're going to make our lives better. Um, and most of these ideas aren't really physical whatsoever. I have to try and know the truths of intangibles, as difficult as it is, as hard to know as they are. Um, we have to try and know these, and if we do, we can make a lot of difference. And all it requires is thinking, we have the time, we have the time, it's the will, and um, knowing how to go about it, but it's, uh, it's, um, it's all up to you. I hope you'll do it. So thank you very much again for your time. All right. Oh, no, I tried Oh, you drove. Can I just make one statement, please? Okay. Did it work? Stand up. Stand up. did have significance, okay? Maybe not to us today, but practical purpose, it was true. They did have a practical purpose. To those prehistoric hunters, those, those things were very important. They weren't paintings that were like on your living room wall. They were put in the most dark, inaccessible places. So they had magical or religious significance, which was fertility of the animals. Yeah, yeah they were used, used for religious yeah. purposes. Right. But some of them were just for their own sake. No, uh -uh. Uh -uh. no they weren't. They weren't, they weren't, they weren't, they weren't, they weren't <laughs> like in their living room Take care. They were in inaccessible parts of the it wasn't there. 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 It w